Welcome to the Lydia and Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and Laura Barbero. We Hello. go back a ways, babe. Uh, how you doing? You're looking great, honey bunny. Oh, thanks. So, Lori, you just got back in the house I traversing, did. picking up your truck in Minneapolis. Yes. Where the not only the protests were outrageous, but now it's the memorial today. It is. Yep. For the murder of another unarmed black man. I was watching it before I got here and I'm like, well, I hope I look okay. <laughs> it's been a rough one. It's been different times. I've I've been in this neighborhood for almost 60 years. I've come and gone, lived in different places, but this... Almost your whole life? Yep. The house that you have been to and that I live in for the past 27 years, I was... I'm the third generation in this house, so... And that house has welcomed many, many people. It's... Let me just describe Lori Barbero for a a (laughs) sweet little minute. First of all, she's... Incredible self-taught drummer. She is the welcome committee of Minneapolis to almost every rock band that's ever passed through there. She was in New York very young. I don't know how we never met then. When you were in the ninth grade, 14 years old, I I was 16, hanging out with Alan Vega, going to CBGBs, moving all around, (laughs) going from Minneapolis to New York, Key West, babes in Toyland, just decided, met Kat, Decided gals are going to start a band, self-taught to be a brutarian, badass female drummer and one of the toughest chick bands. And I say chick with the highest <laughs> of the babes in Toyland. Has also done other music, is a DJ, has had record labels, worked at South by Southwest um, in production management. Damn, girl. Oh, and by the way, I'm promoting, because I've seen the boxes before, not all of them, her forthcoming <laughs> photo book. She's photographed everybody. I wish I could say doing everything that came through her house. Welcome, Lori. Hi, Lydia. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you, my beautiful friend. We were recollecting earlier. I'm surprised we never met in New York when you were 14 and I was 16 or 17. We could have, but, you know, uh, maybe we were sidetracked with other things around us. But you were hanging out with Ellen Vega, like I was. Yeah, quite a bit. Johnny Thunders. Those are kind of the guys and then hung out down on St. Mark's Place a lot and just kind of ran around, went to the big concerts at the Madison Square Garden. Going back to your teenage New York years, you moved with your folks, what, to the suburbs, and then you would go in, or how did that work? I was born in Minneapolis, just a, right. like a mile away from where the house is now. My family lived a block away from here, and then my father's grandparents owned this house, so my dad grew up in it. I, I was basically, you know, I've been here since the day I was born. And then eight, after eighth grade, my dad got transferred to a bank in New York City. Do you remember what the first concert at CBGB's you saw was? The one that stands out the most was when Patti Smith played in, it wasn't CBGB's, but it was the little theater next to it, or CBGB's when it was a theater. They called it the theater or something. It was New Year's okay. Eve. And uh, I remember Bruce Springsteen jumped on stage. There was a riot. There literally was like cops and you can read about it. It was insane. And uh, what year was that? That was New Year's of, I believe, 1977. Wow. Still have the ticket stub. I kept all my ticket stubs. I'm a super freak. You're a super collector. I mean, that's why you have so many photos. That's why I'm really insisting with all those many boxes of photographs you have. Buzz of the Melvins is putting out a photo book. Bob Burt put out a photo book. I put out a photo book here. So I've been taking photos, whatever. And are you going through him now? Probably nine weeks that I was in, that after my the bar I bartended closed, I just went in on my photos. I'm like, okay, this is the time where I tackle this bitch. Maybe it's what it needed to happen for me to do it because I probably went through over 10,000 photos. Oh my God. Um, because I have, wow. I think I counted 49 photo albums and then I have about 21 photo boxes in the boxes. And this is when we used to have to print photos. Yes. That, that was where my money went. You know, I just kind of, a lot of it, you know, and I used to carry. Are they intact? Are they, are they, are they held up pretty well? They're I mean, amazing. You have, they're really, okay. They really are. There's some that, you know, over all the years of 
moving and having photo albums, some, a lot of them are missing, you know. I did have some in some photo albums where the page is literally torn out and there's photos missing because I had people that stay with me, I had friends, you know, everyone would just start looking through them and they're just like, oh, oh shit. You were for quite a while, kind of the welcome committee to Minneapolis. Yes. I mean, I don't even know how many pairs of boots, shoes and Levi jeans, <laughs> not to mention rep ones have passed through your portals, honey. <laughs> if Wells could talk and if I had, I really wish that I had a guest book. If I had that guest yeah. book and now you're talking people, you know, just writing stuff in there and drawing stuff. I am telling you that thinking that that would be put on like the biggest pedestal somewhere because it was pretty amazing all this stuff that happened and people in place, you know, just stories. I mean, you know, and so when I do do this book. And you will. And you will. I would really like to reach out to some of the people, not for every photo, but some of them and say, do you remember this? And then just have them just keep put in something about Minneapolis or about if they remember that night or if they just something that's about stories about them and myself. Or, yeah, you know? an, oral, an oral visual history. So you're in New York during one of the most, you know, ripe periods, right before No Wave and when all that hit. When did you leave and why did you leave to go to Key West? After I graduated from high school in 70, 1978, I worked at a Nathan's... Hot dog? It was in, it was in, it was in Nanuet, New York, which was like the next town. And it was in the parking lot of the Nanuet Mall. And I, I was there and the gentleman that, because they're franchises, he was the sweetest man. But when I graduated, he basically said, I don't have any kids. I have this houseboat. It's in Key West. You should just go down there. Key West is, is more known for writers. I yes. mean, there's a great writer there called Charlie Smith, but who's written quite a few great books. And Key West in Florida in general, for some bizarre reason, has a lot of great writers. It's not really known for music except for death metal or okay. black metal. No, too. Oh, come on. Uh, what's his name? Wasting away in Margaritaville. I mean, that's like, that's where he lives. <laughs> Jimmy Buffett. Jimmy <laughs> Buffett. <laughs> no, no, no. So it, it's known for his writers, but it's also known for his drinkers. I mean, it's a heavy. So you, you go from Minneapolis. It's like, I look at the top heavy drinking cities of, of America. It's like, it's all like Minnesota, Wisconsin around there. And then you get like Key West, but also, it's the it's the the end of Route One. It's the end of the line. It's it's not easy to get there. It's pretty. Yeah, but it must yeah. have been great just for a while to be on a houseboat, yeah. surviving just by slinging whatever you're slinging. Yeah. But I'm sure that grew tiresome after a while. What made you want to go back to to Minneapolis then? How long were you in Key West? I think it's because I was born here, and it is a yeah. really beautiful, wonderful city. And I had some friends and. What year was it that you moved back to Minneapolis again? Um, it would have been nineteen eighty. There's interesting bands coming up in Minneapolis at the time. Yeah. You have Prince, also. You have all this stuff happening. Were you just coming back, or did you just dive right into the music scene, or were you just kind of? Okay. I did. It was. That's why else I went. I came back here because I just knew that there had to be something going on, you know. And I was just after living in New York and experience in the city there, like there has to be fun stuff. So I came to town. I was underage, lied, got a job at the punk rock club, and then it was history from there. That was the beginning of it all. You know, I got worked at the punk rock club called the Longhorn. What was the punk rock club? It was which called one, Jay's, Jay's Longhorn, but we just called it the Longhorn. And Miss Lydia and her posse played there, too. I guess we started at the Longhorn with Eight-Eyed Spy. You did. Is that when we met? Did we meet the we did talk and I was working there and uh, we did talk and I actually hung out with you and you invited me to the hotel that was around the corner the next day. And I won't go into specific specifics about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knocked on your door and the, and the reply was The response was pretty good. We'll talk about that. The, the response I was I want to hear it. I want to hear it. What was the response? It was, this. It was like, yeah, and I'm like, hey, it's Lori from the Longhorn, and you're like, you're like, don't come in unless you want to see me fucking, and I don't remember. Oh well, <laughs> and now you're not going to tell me whether you came in or not. What? <laughs> I gotta hear this one. I mean, it doesn't seem out of character. Seems, no, not seems- at all. And I was like, she's so fucking badass. I'm like, 
That Honey, was- I'm always willing to share a talented dick or two. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know that. I believe it was uh, someone that you were traveling with. Yeah, I'm sure it was somebody because there were two of them in the band that would have been quite what I call a lunchable at the yes. time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and that's when I got to meet George and he was so awesome. And- that's George Scott, who was the bass player of Eight Eyed Spy. We loved dearly anyone who met him. He was yeah. incredible. Yeah. And, you know, he was so strong that when he was drunk, he would rip telephone receivers off of phone boxes until he split his hand once. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's strong. <laughs> and now that beautiful hotel is now, of course, leveled and they put up some ugly building or something like that. But that was called the Andrew Andrew Hotel. You knew after that invitation, we would be yeah. good friends. Yes, that was the that was the start of it. And I'm like, she's just like, I want to be in a band and be that, like that. I want to be that cool someday, you know, just learning, learning from the best. <laughs> well, well, you know, uh, you know, sometimes you got to beat some balls and sometimes you got to beat some skins. So I guess I hope that I encourage you in some ways. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but eventually, besides being in the audience, you had to get into a band. And I guess it was when you met Kat that that's just it. You got to do music. Yeah. I had seen her around a lot. And but she was always just kind of by herself. I try and be nice because, you know, I'm just nice. But I would just see this woman who was by herself. And those were usually the people I befriended were the the lonely ducklings. You know, that's who I liked and I glommed on to, not the ones that were just, ah, you know, and I just like the people that are kind of outside and make them comfortably friend them. And that's what I always liked. Even in- you're boisterous, you're <laughs> outgoing. So, of course, maybe you're attracted used to, to be. I really didn't really used to be as much. You were bold enough to knock on my hotel right. door in right. the, the day. <laughs> oh yeah, you were. Uh, weren't that shy? I didn't. I never. I didn't know you that early on, and I've never known you to be shy. But I understand because so. shy people are attracted to me. I've worked with a lot of the male musicians I worked with are, are quite shy. Thurston yep. Moore, yeah, JG Thurwell, yep. um, Cypress Grove, Roland yep. S. Howard. Yep. There are, you know, shy people, I think, are not afraid of me. Yep. Jim Sclavunos. Yeah. You know, all of those exactly. things. He actually requested, yeah. he's like, do you have any of those pictures from that show at the Longhorn? Going back to pictures, I wrote on the backs of every single mother friggin' picture that I possibly yeah. could. I'd see if I could Google the show if I didn't know what it was. But thank goodness I am so organized that I find the negatives and then had the date and where it was on the negatives. And so I have the negatives that are already dated and all the photos. It's so important because for some freak reason, I too, as kind of a historical documentarian that has managed to document every one of my projects, release it somehow and own it ultimately in the end, it is so important to document stuff, whether it's through photography, through diaries, through music. It's so important especially for anybody, but especially for women, you keep the journals, you take the photos, you make the music, you gotta, it's so important to document. It is. Because here we are 40 years <laughs> later, girlfriend to girlfriend, still here. Yeah. All so right. Lori, what, what, are you, what are you doing to guard all this stuff with all the action in Minneapolis? I mean, there's no home invasions going on, right? It's, it's just it's uh, new retail. In, it's not home invasions and it is retail. And I just drove, down la- I'm two blocks off of Lake Street and Lake Street is basically is where the riot started up at the third precinct, which is my precinct and has been for 27 years. Fuck. And then yeah, they left there, destroyed it. Then they started moving up Lake Street, west on Lake Street. And I'm two blocks off of Lake Street. So every I mean, I lost my post office three blocks away. I mean, Thursday night when they were trying to get to the fifth precinct, they blew up the Wells Fargo at Sarah, which is the biggest one in the Twin Cities, one of the first ones. That's where I got my loan for my home. It used to be Norwest. But my post office, I mean, for fuck's sake, a post office, you know, whatever. And then there's a gas station. There's a strip mall. And there's I have the map of the destruction, and it's quite phenomenal. People are just so fed up, and they have been so yeah. mistreated. First of all, you can't judge every looter. Because we don't know. Because there are, there are rogue elements. People are disgusted. I always feel, know who you're targeting, whether it's violence or looting. Don't target the mom and pop. Don't target the, the places you need. 
And, uh, you know, there are plenty of places that could use a, a good, you know, slap in the fucking crotch or two by whatever means necessary. And again, we cannot sum up every looter. It's just sad when whole neighborhoods where people live are being destroyed. Yes. And I mean, I lived through that as a child as well. And I was in the looting riots of the blackout in 77 in New York. It wasn't near where I lived. And fortunately, where I live now, I'm safe and sound. It's impossible to get your head around because it's hard to blame people for being fed up. But then again, there are, in my opinion, more appropriate places to lob something at. The people in this neighborhood would not destroy their, their neighborhood no. things. And their well, there's been a lot of accusations. There's, there's, been, a lot of, there's been claims of outsiders being arrested, a lot of out-of-staters, of out-of-towners. And, of course, with all the division in the country politically, there's all this fog. And people want to obs- obscure all these lines and, and basically just... As we're seeing just in the whole world, people don't trust any of the institutions. And so how people gauge reality or facts, they kind of just leave it up to themselves, which is, you know, start, that's when you start seeing societies unravel if they don't believe mm-hmm. the institutions around them. But in many ways, how the fuck, why would they believe them? Yeah. So it's, well, well, yeah. And also, listen, first of all, America, born of violence, always violent. We have been protesting for everything forever. And something right now, I feel I'm not an optimist. I'm not a solutionist. It's got to fucking change. It does. You know, it's got to change right now. Yeah. It's just cyclic the same way as the pandemic is, is cyclic. Let's go back to what the origins of our conversation are, because what saved us all from the viral infection of the bullshit that contaminates this entire country has been finding a way to create our way out of it, to find a community that we all still, you look at Lori, the people we knew 40 years ago, we still know. Yes. Our community, they don't always live where we are, but we always come back together. Yes. And music, art, literature in general, I mean, it's not utopic. It was our way to rebel. Yep. And let's talk about the rebellion of something like Babes in Toyland. You didn't know how to play the drums, but eventually you were banging those things like you were born banging them, honey. (laughs) Toyland were so radical, outrageous, rock. They were rock and sexy and fuck you. They were fuck you. And what's interesting about, I mean, both uh, L7 and Babes in Toyland and the period they come up is you did a lot of festivals with a lot of, Look, the male domination of, of rock and roll. Yeah, we did. And, you know, I, I felt like, oh, it, it was just asking because you're, you know, one time Grant Hart said, oh, everyone just likes you because you're girls. And I, that was, <laughs> that's the only thing of Grant and mine's friendship ever where I was just like, I let him have it. And then after I just went off for about an hour, he goes, God, you know, my humor. Like he just, because we were really oh. close, but, you know, he was just, and I just went, like this, but well, yeah. in our entire well, friend, you know what? It's the you know what? Thing. People have always not liked me because I was a woman. <laughs> because, a of your, because of your humor? <laughs> well, they never got that. But, so there you go. Oh, they only like you because you're a girl. Funny. They never like me because I'm undefinable. <laughs> but anyway, you start a band, you get fucking pretty good. Yeah. We worked really you hard. You a lot. Yes. And you know, it's, it's that thing where you just have to work in any industry. The women have to work three times harder than the men to prove that they can be just as good. What I've always kind of compared it to is that when men have a business meeting, they get to go play golf and then they get to end up at the strip club and have some martinis and that's their business meeting. Can you imagine if a bunch of women went out and went shopping and got their nails done and had some glasses of wine? We would be fired in a second. Right. Well, you know, I suggest every woman watch Magic Mike just for Matthew McConaughey's dance moves, because that's the only equivalent we had to any, to any kind of typical. Look, I mean, a Lydia lunch business meeting. I mean, that's yeah. Not, she's, not getting, yeah. she's not getting fired anytime so, soon. So fired get that to yourself. But Kat was a fucking shredder on the guitar and you became not only a pounder, but a, a kind of experimental pounder because you were self-taught. So you're just doing what come the, the rhythm that are coming naturally. Yes. It was very propulsive. It was also weird. It wasn't just straight rock. And there were songs that were very diverse in there. 
was it first that Sonic Youth takes you on tour? You yes. make a couple of singles for Sub Pop. We did do one record and then we did a split with uh, Poison Idea on Sub Pop. And Poison Idea. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yep. Steve just passed away. Uh, Slayer Hippie just passed away a week ago tomorrow, two weeks ago tomorrow. He suddenly passed away. So we started on Twin Town. The first single was on Treehouse, which was local. And then we were on Twin Town Records. And then Tim Carr signed us. Remember, remember when singles meant something. Oh, there you go. I still love them. That's all I love. Well, you're a DJ. One of the things you take in all your rock and roll knowledge is you also DJ. So you're releasing some singles and suddenly it's kind of, it's kind of taken off. Yeah. When we first started and because I was, I had every band come to town. I was a promoter. I brought, I brought like minor threat to town. It's the only time they ever played here. So I rented a hall, got the insurance and put that whole thing together. And I used to do that when I was 20, 21 years old. I think I was when I did that show. So then all the bands used to come to Minneapolis and then they would stay with me. And so then because they always stayed with me and I became friends with them, when it was our turn and Babe started, after about uh, the first, I think it was only nine months, uh, Danny Kabinsky from Detroit called me because we I ended up getting, we're still really close. I just messaged him the other day after all these years. Send my regards to Detroit, yeah. please. And wow, so yeah. he was just, he just basically was like, hey, I want you guys to come on tour with us. It's going to be you. White Zombie and we're headlining. So that was like about nine months after we, I think. What I, year? Do you remember? What must year? Have been, uh, it must have been eight, 88, I think. 88. So how, how was that tour? How was your, that first, how, first of all, how, how long was that? How long were you on that for? Would you say? Uh, it was a little, it wasn't real big, but we did some, sh- you know, a bunch of shows with them and it was super great and that was really fun. So we did that. Friends with them and then I got to know, know uh, White Zombie. And so then that was awesome. And then when they, they came and played Minneapolis, Rob and Sean, when they were together, they'd like, I had a walk-in closet with a mattress. So that's where they stayed. <laughs> where they stayed. <laughs> you know? okay. But yeah, so we, and then from there after that, then Thurston got a hold of us or some, and just asked if we wanted to go to Europe, which was our first time to Europe in 1990 with Sonic Youth. And then that was the best. And then that was... Got it opened up. Yeah. And, and did you do what? Lollapalooza? That, or was that the, the yeah. second one or something? Like, we did okay. Lollapalooza now, in 93. That was three years oh, okay. later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, okay. So really a couple of years on the DIY circuit, Sonic Youth takes you to Europe. Was that right after your first album came out or before your first album? Um, I think it was right after. I believe it okay. was right after. And and obviously, um, what a double bill that must have been. It was so great. It was really, it still is, well, on top of going to Europe for the first time, you know, and then it, getting to go with them, really still till today, I am so, it's the great, it just is great. And I learned a lot from them, you know, I learned a lot of a lot of the ropes and a lot of the DIY and a lot of everything, you know. And observe. Hanging out with Thurston is still one of my favorite pastimes, I have to say. It. <laughs> Babes kind of took off pretty quickly. I mean, your first album sold a lot of copies. Uh-huh. Like I said, we worked really hard. And then once we got back and then we got to play in First Avenue in the main room and then we were paid because we went out to Europe with Sonic Youth. You know, they they blasted our hymen wide open for any show, any show that we pretty much wanted. And then we went out with you know, a dinosaur junior, Faith No More, My Bloody Valentine. I mean, there's so many of them. And then Lollapalooza. Who was, besides you, you enjoyed touring with Sonic Youth, but you were on a lot of big festivals around that period. If anyone was to say, what's one of your favorite all-time songs in the whole wide world? It's Death Valley 69. Whoa. Aww. Well, which we all know that story. I rode <laughs> it on a bus going up to Spanish Harlem with T-Bone Moore. That would be Thurston Moore. Thank you very <laughs> yeah. much. No, it really is. That's one. I mean, that really is. I, I play it pretty much every time I DJ. Um, mm. And I one time he, they did it at a sound check in Europe when we were on tour with them because he knew how much I love that song. And they played it at sound check, and he, I could hear him going, "Lori, where are you, Lori?" Where? And I was backstage. I ran out, and they started playing it, and I just went, Bleh! I just started crying, and I. Oh. And I was flailing around like a whirling dervish. She was just like, Lydia's voice wasn't there, but, you know, they played it. And I was just like, "There, this is for me. My well, private- you know, Lori, I've heard of people crying in horror at some of my music. I'm glad you cried with joy. 
Thank you very it much. It was. It was great. I, I do have a lot of tears of joy. I cry a lot. Last, when- I remember, I wouldn't say tears of joy, but at one point, after I'd stayed at your house numerous times, and I'm like, uh, Laurie, I think you need to go on a spoken word tour with me. You know, I'm always doing that to people. Now, I know we were in your Jeep. I don't remember where we went. And I don't know if you played your man told stories. You tell me. Well, what did we do? How'd that happen? When was that? Now, this is what happened. I answer my phone. I get this phone call. And we we only met in New Orleans where you, well, it's where we kind of hung out. It's the first time we really hung out, you know, spending time together. Well, you call me. I don't know how you got my number, whatever. You, maybe we swapped it when I was in New Orleans. You give me a call and I'm like, hello. And you're like, and it's my landline. This is how long ago it was. Landline. <laughs> and it's like, hi, is this Lori? And I'm like, yep. And you, this is Lydia Lunch. And I was like, oh yeah, right. How you doing? You know, just thinking, because my girlfriends, I mean, people just knew that I, I adored you. And I, you know, I was just like, oh my God, I love her. So I just thought it was someone telling me it was Lydia Lunch. And I was just like, oh, yeah, right. Okay, whatever. And you're like, yeah. So I, and all of a sudden he started talking about these plans. And I was like, wait, it really is her. And I was just was like, I can go on trying to get my tongue out of my throat. Plans? For well, you know. Hey, can we, I'm like, you're coming with me. The yep, plans? No, you were like that. And you know what I said? I was so freaked out. I said, I've never done anything like that. And you're like, well, that's even a better reason. I said, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. I was so freaked out. And I said, okay, can I just think about it? Because I couldn't even answer because my heart was hitting the wall on the opposite side of the room. My tongue was swollen in my throat and there were just sweat. I'm just going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. So I said, you're like, okay, well, I'll call you Monday. And I think pretty sure it was like a Friday. Call you Monday. Well, I ended up, smoking some weed and then I knew you were probably going to call me I was so scared I was curled up in my bed <laughs> I curled up in a little ball going oh my god I can't do it I can't do it and then you just and then I said I don't think I can do it and you said I'm not taking no for an answer <laughs> well first of all I had no idea this was and look you were playing in front of a lot of fucking more people than I played in my friend of my whole life I'm like we're just gonna go play in front of 50 people do whatever we want it's gonna be fun like you got a jeep I need to go there you should come and do it you never did it why don't we do it you had some stuff and you had your you know your genius brain just just saying whatever you thought and I'm like I don't know what I'm gonna do because it's just me and I'm used to hide behind drums whatever you said well you know what you've told me some, you have these really wild premonitions and these dreams and all this stuff. Why don't you think of some of those and put some good ones together and, you know, we'll just do that. And that's what I did. And it, even till today, I, when this whole thing started, the pandemic and being in quarantine, I started writing down the crazy shit that was happening. Crazy stuff. I have a whole, it's all in my journal. I just dream, dream, like, dreams, dreams, you're saying. These ones aren't dreams. These are things that are really crazy that happened since I've been uh, pretty much in my house. I've done three marches in the past nine days. And then I've gone up to 38 to Cup Foods where Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd. I've been up there. It's about 10 blocks from my house. I've been up there four, I think four times. Tell me a little about that experience. So how long did we, so you're driving your Jeep. Yep. Where'd we go? What do we do? Yep. I had an international scout, 1972. Was it 72? International scout. It was, I love that. That was my favorite. I was driving, you were riding jackknife. <laughs> and uh, we went to Madison, Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit. And then we came back to Minneapolis and did it at Minneapolis and that, but I'll tell you, do you, do you remember in um, Milwaukee, we stayed at this, ho- at this hotel, we walk in and it's on the lake that, no, was it Milwaukee or was it Madison? Where did, where did uh, Otis Redding die? It was in Wisconsin, I think. But anyways, from what I remember, but anyways, we get to this place, we, and I'm not kidding, we, we check in and they said, you're in room 666. And I looked at, do you remember that lady? And I look at her. No. I look at you and I go, is that the room that you asked for? And she look, you look at me and you're like, you go, you really think I knew that? I'm like, yes. <laughs> but they gave us room 666. But the weird thing was that the office, you know, where you check in and stuff is on the top floor because it was on a cliff that went down to the lake. 
And so we went down six floors to room 666. And I'm, we were sharing a room? Yes. We had fun. D-I-M, do it myself with my main witch. It was so fun. So I know I'm just ranting on this tour. What are you doing? Are you playing drums and telling stories in between? Or? Nope, I didn't do any drums. I just told stories. I just said... I just kind of said I've I've had a life where I've dreamt things and they and it, they really happened or I I realized what was going on or things that have really happened in real life uh, that I already knew that were going to happen and I called. So them. after the first performance, were you more comfortable? I was. Or did you? And I do credit you for pushing me to do something that I never did before. I don't know if anyone else could have done that because I really I was just like I, I uh, it was pretty fucking cool. Well, to quote. Thurwell, my favorite song he ever wrote, I can do any goddamn thing I want. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? So can anybody if they I just want to do it bad enough. No. I just knew you had stories. I thought we would have a good time, yeah. and we did. This was like 30 years ago. I've always had that cattle prod. I know. <laughs> it was just, it's really crazy, though. I'm pretty sure it was, well, I don't know the exact date. I can look it up. One little detail about 666. All right, Tracy Lords, maybe one of the best porn stars ever, and not one of the brightest women on the planet, but that doesn't matter. Been in some good films. Once came to my house with Paul Zown, asked me if I was a Satanist. I'm like, what is a Satanist? Of course, she couldn't tell me. So I had to tell her, well, a Satanist, according to the Carney Barker, Anton LaVey, Really, a Satanist is someone that professes, do unto others as you want done unto you. Women are the magical sexual creatures. Bow down to the bitch at the altar and um, just watch what you fucking do. And pleasure is the ultimate rebellion. That's Satanism. It has nothing to do with the devil. Yeah. The devil. The devil. I mean, if you believe in the devil, you got to believe in God. And I'm sorry, I don't believe in either yes. of these mythologies, but here we go. I just thought that that was wild. We we check in and and then they're like, you just take the elevator six floors down. And we, I'm like, down? Like what? We have room 666 and we're going down? <laughs> it was just like the song Death Valley 69, down, down, down. <laughs> Babes in Toyland was just one part of your life, and it was a fantastical part because, look, you love music. Your first band you get into really takes off. It's monumental because it's three badass babes, hard, weird, experimental rocking, selling a lot of records, doing major tours, being at a lot of festivals that are mainly male-dominated yes. by music. But that's one part of your life. I mean, you did other music after that. We did our thing. You also had your own record label. You're a DJ. You've done many, many things. And the next thing you're doing is getting this photo book together. Because you are, like me, a documentarian. And your way of journalizing has been through photography. My way of journalizing has often been through spoken word or music. That's where we are at. That's so important. It really is. And especially from the mouths of, of women that are wise, that have gone through a lot and are in touch with not just the, anything that, that isn't past the end of their noses. You know, we're very aware of everything and we can tell you what's probably going to happen next before anyone else has a clue. So, Honey, I've been talking about the shit that's going down right now. We know for how long do must I admit? I sometimes feel like, you know, I'm on the mountain with a bullhorn. Yeah. The only thing missing is my rifle and a dog, and I don't have dogs. There are just some women that naturally connect, and we've had a few on the podcast, that do have insight, that do understand on a larger scale, that do have a greater vision. And also because everything is so cyclical. Everything is so cyclical, same as it ever was, comes around, goes around, and also there's intuition. Yeah. I just, I've always said intuition is the one motherfucking thing that no one can take away from the us women. And that's, I mean, really that's intuition. You go for it. The very first thing you feel, you just go with that because if you don't, you, I know that you'll regret it. Well, and it's also what's made you successful, not only in music with, you know, one of the first all female, I hate to use that term, but I'm going to, weird rock bands that had success, 
But not only that, but having your own record company, deciding to work at South by Southwest, seven years doing production management yeah. because you're so good with people. Mm-hmm. You know, you've worn many hats because we has weird women of many disciplines. That's what we do. Yeah, it is what we do. It's <laughs> what brought yeah. us together in the first place. It yes. keeps us together. <laughs> yeah. Amen, lady. But, yeah, when I met you, Lori, uh, you know, you seem so uh, grounded on so many levels, really, really uh, personal and very welcoming. Great, great hanging with you. You were in that transition of those bands that were kind of in the underground that suddenly, for whatever reason, had huge global attention come late 80s, early 90s, when all that stuff started really blossoming on the international scale. You're easy to get along with. Did you see any motherfuckers really change and like i don't recognize this fucker anymore <laughs> yeah there were yep there were a few but you know what ones i'm thinking of they really became where i was just like fuck man i don't even know them and they don't they're just off they're like they've been taken away by the the mighty wind and but they really have come back and i think now they actually know where they came from because now they've gotten older and who knows if it's just maturing or if it's just that they're now they're more grounded because they aren't. I mean, I, I don't like to cross this, bring this subject up ever. But now that you've kind of led me down this path, I mean, I have to bring up the Courtney issue because and I've never had very much experience with Courtney Love, except my opinion of her is she stole Kat's dress. She stole Babes in Toyland Sound. She ripped off my attitude and somehow as she married a rock star and I'm not going to go further with my conspiracy theories about that. I think she's somebody that has always been tragically trauma, traumatically fucked up. I like to refer to her as a train wreck crashing into a bank, but you had personal experience with her. And I have to say one of my favorite, <laughs> I have to get Davies here, Julian Cope. A teardrop explodes. One to, once you've got a full page ad in one of the British weeklies warning people about her before she latched on to. I didn't know that. Kurt oh, I didn't know that. Now, and my only experience with Julian Cope was one acid laden night where I didn't know who teardrop explodes was, but he had acid. I met him at the whiskey. He had a rainbow colored cock. It was all good. All I can say. And then when he huh, did that, because let's face it, I think Courtney's ruined a lot of people's lives. I haven't seen her since 2003. And but just tell me about your experience with her because she lived in, in Minneapolis show. for a while and her and Kat were in a ba- previous band together with Jennifer Finch. I didn't know that Jennifer Finch was involved. But Jennifer Finch who went on and is still in L7. Yeah. So I really can't even remember the name of it right now because doesn't matter. It's been, a, it's been a wild week. I don't even know how to spell my last name. But um, And so she came here because her and Kat were friends. And then they were both talking about starting a band. And apparently... This is like what, 85? This is an 88. 1988. And so apparently they were at First Avenue. I was dancing. And I guess they were both like, I want that girl in my band. And so they oh, kind of excuse me, dancing because I did read that you were a disco I dance winner know. as a child. Wow. I was. And did we ever dance together? Because, uh, honey, I love to dance. I, maybe we have because we right. have so many date. Yep. Date yes, coming. Okay. Carry on. I want to do that. And so I guess apparently I was dancing and I guess they were watching and they just both kind of said, I want that girl in my band. And then it was that joke where, no, I want her in my band. I want her in my mm-hmm. band. And apparently Kat won. Courtney moved away. And that was kind of the dealio. And, uh, you know, we did when we went on to L.A., I, I had met her. And then I went to the opening of I saw it at a drive in movie. Um, <laughs> And that's where the opening was. And that's where Mad Mark Rude was my date. I'll think of the movie. Straight to Hell. And I went as her guest. And that was that was even before 88. So um, that was when I think I first met her. And she was friends. She hung out with Joe Cole. And A very good friend of mine. Yeah. And we're not even going to go into that nightmare. No. Because no. It's, a, it's a story unto itself. Yeah. But. And uh, so it just, you know. Then she came to the cities and her and Kat hang out. And then 
Kat and I started started the band, and then well, because you you were going to actually do it, and you were ready to apply to it right yes. then. Yes, I was, and Kat and I just kind of. We did start talking at a uh, barbecue and then that's after she was always kind of off. And I always thought she was just always kind of off on her own because she always wanted the she wanted to be kind of sad and lonely. So the boys would pay attention to her. She wanted to be what? Sad and lonely. So the boys would pay attention to her. You know, I I know. I know. Sad girl. I got one of those inside of me. (laughs) And this hotel that many months live in. Oh, yeah. Not often. By the way, I saw the Babes in Toyland reunion. You did. I have photos. Was it at the Roxy or the Whiskey? It was at the Roxy. At the Roxy in LA. I think it was 2015. It was. I was there with Xene. You were. Janita Sparks (laughs) was there as well. Did you guys ever play with L7? We did. And that was that was really fun. I love those girls. I just saw them recently. Um, I still talk with Jennifer. Amazing. Pretty amazing. Yeah, they are really, really great. And just the other day. When I was doing a podcast, Linda Perry does a thing called We Are Here. I did this podcast with uh, Dr. Fink from The Revolution and okay. myself and Kai Ahrens. And the, the other the guy that was the producer who, who was doing all the recording said, oh, you know, he's, he said, they, they said to say hi. And I was like, oh, my God. So that was, I just, I love those ladies. But I mean, here, here we go. We are focusing now when we say L7, when we say Denise Sparks. When we talk about you, talk about me. Also, Babes in Toyland did some political concerts. Yes. Right. What was it? We did a lot of uh, Rock for Choice. Right. We did that. You know, um, and- when we were down in Miami, Florida, we were playing with uh, Seven Year Bitch, Jack yeah. Off Jill, Babes in Toyland. Is the day that I met Mike, the, who is now Marilyn Manson. But uh, he was standing there with loose hair and he just had a T-shirt on and black mm-hmm. jeans. And I remember his black Converse shoes. He introduced himself and he was and he was just like, oh, I love you guys and talking to him. And, he, and I remember meeting him because he said, someday I'm going to be famous. I'll just never forget it. I was just and I just well, remember and, and I went, there's got to be an Alice Cooper. Yep. For it would be nice for every generation. Yes. But that day was the day we were doing this benefit against domestic abuse. And so the, each, all the money that we got at the door in this huge theater got sold out. Each band shared it equally. And then I donated it to a place right across the street from the post office that burned down. But it's, it's still there. It's the Harriet Tubman House, home for abused women and their children. So. But also that's what connects you, me, Danita Sparks, Exene Cervanka. And various other women who actually did have political intentions. And even though we, st- we didn't go into music thinking this is a political move, it was political at the time because it, there was no precedent before it. And also then each individually somehow in our own way, I mean, I just as, you know, the, <laughs> the prophet on the mountain with the bullhorn and, you know, just by being radical female non-musicians making incredible music at a time when we were it, it was political anyway. And, and some of us are still political. And right now, you, whether you like it or not, and I know you are, you are in the middle of a very political moment that centers two blocks from your house. We know that radical change has to happen. We've actually been fighting for it our whole life as women in music and just as as radical political people. This is the Lydia Spin with Lori Barbero, Tim Dahl. We are radically opposed to what this country has become. Change has got to happen. We will not stop doing what we do. We will find many different ways throughout the decades to show exactly how you can rebel through art, through music, through literature, through photography. And I love you, sister. And I love you too. Thank you very much. Thanks, hon. Thank you. 